Hi guys, this is Rich from Bedtime Stories. I hope you're all well uh, and that you enjoyed the 100th episode special on the Gurning Man of Glasgow. Um, we're going to follow that up now with some bonus content. Um, and this came about through our patrons and channel members. Basically what we did was put out a poll asking those guys what they would like to see for the 100th episode special. Uh, and we gave them a choice of four different options. The first of which was the remastered version of the Flannan Isles Lighthouse Mystery with uh, completely new artwork and uh, new details added to the script. Um, obviously that was because that episode was the one that launched the channel and uh, has a special place for us. Um, the second option was a super famous case, something like Roswell or Jack the Ripper. Um, the third option was a super obscure case, which you'd probably never heard of. And the fourth option was uh, personal experiences of the Bedtime Stories team. Now, obviously, the third option won, um, but we were always a bit concerned about that because how do you hype up something that nobody knows about? How do you make something special out of that? Um, so what we did instead was decide to do the two most popular options and uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, however you, you look at it, option four was the second most popular. So we're going to be sharing some of our experiences with you. Um, this particular episode is just going to focus on me, the narrator. And we'll probably do Simon for another milestone and Mikey for another milestone after that. Um, but that all depends on uh, your feedback. If you don't like it, then we'll take that on board and we probably won't do this again. If you do, then... We're open to ideas. So the format of this is going to be slightly different. Um, I don't have a script. I'm completely freestyling. I'm sitting here in the dark, sipping a beer, just relating the stories as they come to me. Um, Mikey will still illustrate the stories in the same way that he always does. Um, but because this is completely off the bat, there probably will be a, a lack of subtitles, unfortunately. Um... Before we get going, I'd just like to say that I myself err on the side of scepticism when it comes to the stories that we present. I'm always looking for the more rational sort of uh, explanation. But at the same time, because of certain experiences I've had in my life, there haven't been many, but um, from what I have experienced, uh, my mind remains open to alternate possibilities. So, uh, yeah, without further ado, let's get going. So my first weird experience, and I'm going to say weird experience rather than um, paranormal, even though to my mind it was paranormal, but you, you guys might disagree, occurred when I was about 14 or 15 years old, um, and at the time I lived in a small village out in the country. Now when I was much younger, living out in the sticks was this great adventure, you know, there was um, endless fields that you could go off and explore, or you know, you could go into the woods and play army with your mates and stuff. But by my mid-teens, that kind of horseplay had become a little dull, as, as you can imagine. Um, you want to do more grown-up kind of things. And the only thing for kids my age to do was really to go around to a friend's house and, and play video games. And it was on just such an occasion that I had this particular experience. Now, I should preface this by saying that this is actually my friend's story. Um, well, at least the, the wider experience is, but... Um, I witnessed a very small part of it. And it occurred as I was going around to call for him, as we did in those days before mobile phones. We just used to cold call. It's not like today where you, you, you phone them up and see if it's okay to meet up. You know, it was just uh, what we did. And I just walked through his uh, front gate and was making my way up towards his front door when I saw a young girl of about two or three years old running around the side of his house. Didn't think anything of it at the time because he's the eldest of uh, seven children, uh, big family, so I just assumed it was his younger sister. There was nothing weird or um, untoward that immediately stood out and I just uh, kind of continued on up the path. Got to his front door, he answered and invited me in and we just sat there playing on the PlayStation or whatever it was. Um, might have been a Sega Saturn, I can't remember. Um, and it was only after about five minutes that I noticed the house was unusually quiet. Again, big family, so I'd have expected the house to be 
uh, bouncing with activity. So I asked him where everyone was, and he said that they'd all gone out shopping and that um, we were the only ones there. And I said, well, I've just seen your little sister out in the garden running down the alley at the side there. To which he replied, you can't have done, she's out shopping with my mum and dad. And then he pulled like a, a thoughtful kind of face and said, was she wearing a pink dress? And that was one of the things that made me notice her in the first place. Um, there was like this bright flash of pink as she ran past. And so I said, yeah, yeah, she was in a, in a pink dress. To which his expression changed again to a, a, you know, a sort of slight smile. And he said, no, that wasn't my sister. You've just seen a ghost. And of course, I just laughed it off saying, yeah, whatever. Um, but then he proceeded to tell me about what had been going on in his house over the last uh, month or so. And a couple of months beforehand, his family had gone on a, a caravan holiday over in Wales, you know, um, sun, sea, sandcastles, that kind of thing. But he had chosen to remain at home. Um, he was 16 at the time, so a year or two older than me. And he felt that he was getting a bit too old for that kind of, uh, you know, family holiday. So he said that he would stay behind and look after the house instead. Almost like a a rite of passage for him, a um, little bit of independence, coming of age, that kind of thing. So his parents agreed and asked his neighbours to come and, and check on him every now and then. And off they went, leaving their eldest son at home. Now, they were supposed to have been gone for two weeks, if I remember correctly, um, but they ended up coming back after only four days. And I remember him being really annoyed about that because he was uh, enjoying that time alone, and so he questioned why they had come back so soon and his parents explained it away as something like the weather wasn't great or they just weren't enjoying themselves and you know so he, he thought nothing more of it but after about a week or so um, weird things began to happen in the house whenever he was there alone um, and I think the, the first occurrence was one day when he was standing at the kitchen sink doing the washing up uh, looking out of the window into the back garden when he saw a little blonde head of hair go bobbing past just below the windowsill. He didn't see a body or anything, just the top of the head as if somebody small was running past the window. And his first thought was that it was his little sister. But then he remembered that his parents had gone out and his little sister wasn't even at home. So he ran out of the back door into the garden and looked around. Nothing. Nobody there. Obviously, he thought it was strange and just kind of um, put it down to his imagination. But then other strange things began to happen. Um, for instance, he'd be watching TV, again in the house alone, and he would hear the pitter-patter of little feet running about in the upstairs hallway or in the bedrooms. And he would get to the bottom of the stairwell just in time to see um, this kind of tail end of a pink dress disappearing around the corner of the wall on the top step as if someone had uh, you know run past and he'd just just missed them kind of thing other times he'd be doing some chore or relaxing and he would suddenly get the feeling that he was being watched and he would turn just in time to see a blonde head of hair disappearing around the door frame as if you know somebody had been peeping their head around watching him and as he had turned they'd kind of pulled back now, of course, this was starting to freak him out, but I think the, the tipping point came when uh, one day he was lying on the sofa watching TV and there was this almighty crash which came from upstairs. So loud it sounded as if someone had tipped a wardrobe or chest of drawers over. And when he went up to check, he went across the uh, upstairs landing from room to room and he could not see anything out of place or in disarray. Certainly nothing which might have caused um, such, a, such a commotion. And as he was checking the last room, he apparently heard the sound of a little girl giggling inside uh, the wardrobe. And when he opened it up, there was nobody inside. This frightened him so much that he ran downstairs out of his front door and then sat in the front garden until his parents came home. And when they did, he grabbed his mom and told her what had been going on in the house and that he knew something had happened on that holiday, uh, which was the real reason they had come back. 
and he demanded to know what the hell was going on. So he kind of sussed the connection between the two things based on the timings, you know. And after some prying, his mom eventually told him that on the first night in the caravan, she had awoken to find a little girl in a pink dress sitting on the end of their bed, who she thought was their youngest daughter. But as she had reached out to grab her, this little girl had vanished right in front of her eyes, just like faded away into nothing. And she'd initially put this down to a a kind of um, waking dream. Uh, you know those instances where you you wake up and you're still able to see the, the visual aspect of um, whatever you were dreaming of. But as the holiday continued, their children began to talk about a young girl in a pink dress who was coming into their bedrooms at night and waking them up by giggling or tapping them and running away. And they described her as having a completely blank face with no eyes, nose or mouth and they said that she was uh, frightening them and so that's why they decided to come home early Uh, but not before my friend's mom had made a complaint to the campsite owner who said that some years before a little girl had drowned in the stream which which, uh, ran behind the caravan about 30 feet away Um, And my friend believed that this little girl had followed his family home and then somehow uh, attached herself to him. Now, I know some of you are are probably listening to this and and thinking it sounds like nonsense, and (laughs) I wouldn't blame you if you did. Uh, But personally, I believe my friend's story because, first of all, I've known him for most of my life since I was about nine years old, and I can tell when he's uh, pulling my leg. Not only that, his mom had corroborated the story um, pretty much word for word regarding what had happened in the caravan and she also told us about other things that had been happening in the house which she herself had witnessed. And then finally I know that I saw that little girl with my very own eyes. Is it possible she was some random child from another household trespassing in my friend's garden? Absolutely. Of course it is, which is why I labelled this as weird rather than paranormal. But for me, that seems unlikely, given that the rear of their property was well secured with high fences, and I feel it was just a little too coincidental for my friend to have described this girl before I had even told him anything about her. My second weird experience occurred a few years later when I was about 18 and by this time my um, my family had moved out of the country and into the suburbs of the town where I still reside to this day. And I just want to say this experience wasn't really creepy. Um, if anything, I thought it was, it was kind of cool. Um, now the town where I live is what's known as a new town as we call them in the UK. And what that means is that it's basically just a collection of smaller towns and villages all banded together under one unitary authority. This creates a a weird kind of setting where you have uh, vast swaths of uh, rural land with centres of population dotted throughout all over the place, all surrounding one main town centre. Now there's a, a, a footpath which stretches about 14 miles from the north end of the town to the south, and it links many of these populated areas, which was a godsend to me back in the days before I got my license because, uh, I mean, I used to cycle everywhere and I could get anywhere in the town within, you know, like an hour or so. And I was using this path back in the summer of um, 2000 on my way back from the town centre after having met up with some friends. And I was just nearing the estate where I lived when I saw a group of people standing on the path in front of me. Now at this point, the path runs past a sprawling 16th century manor house which has been converted into a hotel. And on the opposite side, uh, there's a football pitch. Um, So I just assumed that the guests there were watching uh, a football match as they were standing at the edge of this pitch. But as I got closer, I realised that they were all um, looking up towards the sky. And as I passed them, I turned to look in the same direction and immediately slammed on my brakes. 
about half a mile distant and around, I don't know, 300 feet off the ground, was this black 3D hollow diamond shape, slowly rotating as it sat there in the sky. And between the top and the bottom apexes of this diamond was a weird kind of squiggle. And you could see the sky through the gaps in the centre. Um, now, the group of people who were there were all kind of talking amongst themselves, discussing um, what this thing might be. And I remember someone saying that they thought it was some sort of weird-shaped blimp or um, like a hot air balloon. And that kind of made sense to me because there was a, a festival on in the town park at the time, as there is every summer. And my immediate thought was that it was a, a child's balloon which had got loose. And looking back, obviously, you know, given the distances, you know, it's perhaps just a little too big to be a balloon. So that's why I jumped on the idea of a, like a blimp or hot air balloon instead. And that was the kind of consensus amongst all of us as we stood there watching this thing for about, I don't know, five minutes until it shot off. Just like that, it was gone. There was no sound. There was no kind of gradual acceleration. It was literally there one second and gone the next there was a split second elongated smudge on the sky, almost indicating its direction of travel, and then that dissipated and there was nothing. Um, I'd never seen anything like it before, and I've never seen anything like it since. Um, in my mind, there's no question that it was a UFO, as it was certainly unidentified. It didn't look like any conventional aircraft I've ever seen. Um, so I guess my only question is, who was piloting it? My third and final strange experience, which I'm going to relate here, occurred later in life when I was approaching my 30s. And to be honest, this was a whole series of incidents all centred around um, one household. Just to give some backstory, um, me and my girlfriend began dating back in 2010. And on our very first date, we talked about films we had watched recently, uh, one of which was Paranormal Activity 2. Um, now this naturally led on to a conversation about ghosts in general and whether either of us believed in them and whilst I was rather sceptical despite a few weird experiences she said straight out that she did and that furthermore the house she was living in at the time was haunted. She then went on to tell me about all these uh, things that were going on there and I kind of listened with a mixture of open-mindedness and um, you know healthy scepticism and every now and then I'd ask a question like, are you sure it's not just the floorboards creaking back into place or, you know, were there any windows open, that kind of thing. But she was adamant that something wasn't right about that house. Um, fast forward six months or so and I was stopping over maybe a couple of nights a week and in all that time I hadn't seen or heard a single thing at that property that would suggest it was haunted. And I was seriously starting to wonder whether she was imagining things, maybe um, scaring herself while she was there alone. Um, but again, she was adamant, and she explained that the activity only seemed to occur whenever I wasn't there, and that it was getting worse. For instance, um, originally it was just a case of things disappearing from one location, only to reappear somewhere else in the house, or ornaments would inexplicably fall off shelves, that kind of thing. But it had now moved on to uh, doors opening by themselves and even like a, a full-bodied apparition um, appearing in her bedroom. So she was genuinely terrified of being there on her own. I honestly didn't know what to make of the whole thing, but that soon changed. I remember the first time I witnessed anything. I was stopping at her house on a weekend and I was lying in bed at 2am struggling to get to sleep. I think it was uh, summer at the time and the heat was just unbearable. Anyway, my girlfriend was fast asleep next to me and I remember thinking about the things she had said. And I thought to myself, wouldn't it be cool if something weird happened right now? And no sooner had that thought entered my brain, uh, there was this enormous thump right outside the bedroom door. It was so loud that my um, girlfriend sat bolt upright out of a deep sleep and it was so powerful that it felt like the whole house vibrated as it happened. And I shot right out of bed and began looking around for anything which might have caused it, like something falling over, 
and there was just nothing. This wasn't a, a like a floorboard creaking back into place and it wasn't a door slamming shut in a draft. It sounded and felt like someone had hit an interior wall with a huge, and I mean huge, fist or hammer of some kind. Of course, after that, all kinds of weird things started happening whilst I was there, but I would always only witness the aftermath. Um, For instance, I would never see anything physically fall from a shelf or window ledge. I would only hear it and then arrive to find whatever had fallen on the floor. We would hear a door slam shut, but never see it with our own eyes. Um, We would hear footsteps walking about upstairs or moving around downstairs whenever we were in bed, but we would never see what was causing them. Um, For my girlfriend, though, this was a very different experience whenever she was there alone. Things always seemed to happen right in front of her. And of course, I was trying to be rational about the whole thing, you know, looking for drafts, checking door hinges... Uh, leaving my camera running overnight with bait to see if there was a mouse or rat problem, um, all that kind of thing. I checked everything that might explain what was going on, but I couldn't find a damn thing. And about 18 months later, I had moved in with my girlfriend, and ever since that point, things seemed to have died down. Uh, We decided to just kind of ignore the activity, and as we did that, it occurred less and less. But the weirdest thing, and the thing that freaked me out more than anything else, is what occurred just after Christmas 2012. My girlfriend had been cleaning upstairs, and she had gone into the study where I used to um, sit and work or play video games or whatever. And for Christmas, she had gotten me this massive box of Ferrero Rocher. I'm not sure if you get them in the United States, but they're like a ball of chocolate with a creamy hazelnut center and each one is wrapped in its own kind of individual gold wrapper of course i'd ate the lot and left these gold wrappers strewn all over my computer desk which she begrudgingly cleared up for me and she'd threw them all in the waste bin in the corner of the study and um, she'd also chucked in this pair of old socks which had seen better days And then off she went downstairs to get the hoover. Now as she came back upstairs, she almost had a heart attack. All I heard from downstairs was, Rich, Rich, come and look at this. And I came running up the stairs behind her and was confronted with a sight that just didn't make any sense to me at all. Sitting on the top step in a very precise pyramid formation were all of these Ferrero Rocher wrappers and balanced on top of them, standing upright, was this old pair of socks. The socks were barely touching the tip of this pyramid shape, and were balanced in such a way that it was, uh, well, uh, physically impossible. They should have been tipping over one way or the other, but instead, it looked like they were just being held there by uh, like an invisible hand. Um Of course, me being me, I reached out to touch it, and before my fingertips even reached the socks, I got this kind of static shock, and the whole thing just crumbled. Um, The socks fell, all the foil wrappers lost their rigidity, and uh, it just kind of collapsed into this this messy pile. And that was one of the last weird things that occurred um, in that house. We lived there for another six years, and the activity just kind of dissipated, died away. Um didn't experience anything for the last you know five four or five years um now do i think the house was haunted actually no uh but my reasoning for this is as pseudoscientific as any paranormal research really um and the reason i say that is because when my girlfriend was about 19 years old uh she sustained quite a nasty head injury which caused her to suffer from seizures afterwards Um, this affliction lasted for about three or four years and then the seizures suddenly stopped however when i met her in 2010 uh, she was going through quite a stressful time which was causing lack of sleep and these seizures began to re-emerge so whenever she got overtired or or felt too stressed um, you know she'd get worse with this condition kind of thing 
and this this all came on about the same time that the paranormal activity began at her house and over the next two years as the seizures began to alleviate so too did the paranormal activity now when researching cases for this channel I've often heard about a hypothesized connection between alleged poltergeist activity and people who suffer with um, seizures or high stress levels and as the theory goes seizures may manifest some unconscious or dormant kind of telekinesis and as crazy as that sounds I do often wonder if um, this is what was behind the activity as opposed to you know spirits of deceased people simply playing tricks I mean which sounds more realistic perhaps neither of them uh, but still you know who knows so yeah that's that's me those were my experiences and um, before I go I just want to say that everything I've told you in this bonus episode is true uh, I fully expect that many people won't believe what I've said and that's perfectly fine uh, believe me when I say I've had a harder time convincing myself than other people even though in the grand scheme of things I've probably experienced very little compared to others um, but it has made me sit back and reflect on the world we inhabit um, sometimes I do feel that uh, perhaps not all is as it seems so thank you for listening and thank you for getting us to our 100th episode um, we really appreciate your support as always and uh, yeah, let us know in the comments if you'd like to see more videos like this at future milestones and uh, we'll speak to you soon.